So, Lord Jesus, once again, we come before you on a Monday evening and we look forward to your thoughts and um, your love to be demonstrated through your word. We pray that you would use your word as you see fit in our lives individually and just continue to bless us with these thoughts as we begin to understand more and more about your faithfulness and your holiness. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be starting with um, uh, going into Deuteronomy 28. This chapter is very heavy. This chapter is, <clears throat> when we look at it from our perspective, we'll see that this is a prophecy. It is a the future history of Israel. It goes all the way from the time that Moses decrees this to today. And what's interesting about this is chapters 28 and 29 are written in the style of a ancient contract, a contract between a king and the people. And in this case, it's between God and the country. And in those type of, of agreements, they'd have the contract and at the end would be a statement declaring what would happen to the people if they didn't keep it the consequences of being the contract, and of course, the benefits and, if you will, blessings of keeping the contract. In Deuteronomy here, it's other way around. Chapter 28 is a statement of all the blessings and curses that will happen um, if you keep the contract and if you don't keep the contract. And um, some of this is pretty rough, but from the beginning, we'll just say that God is a God that keeps his word. And as we've said before, if God keeps his word to his own hurt, keeps his word to things that are sad, we can certainly trust him to keep his word for things that, that bless him. Before we go, I just want to go back to the very last verse of chapter 27. Chapter 27, it ended with the instructions for once they went into the land and took it over to have this big responsive worship service. The Levites would state blessings and curses and the people would respond with amen. It hasn't happened yet. It'll happen later on in Joshua 8. But um, there's just a list of requirements and things that people will say um, amen to. And the list of the curses here. And the very last one says, verse 26, cursed be he, be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. This is interesting. It's kind of a catch-all. And this catch-all is basically saying, even if you don't break any of the laws, but you don't consciously affirm that the laws will bring about curses, that is breaking the law. And I was thinking about that and comparing that to James 2.10, which says that anybody that stumbles in any one part of the law is declared guilty of all. And what this means for humanity is that relative righteousness states that, well, at least I'm better than some people, therefore I get some credit for being good. And God, of course, says that doesn't count at all. The law is perfection. <clears throat> and a little stumble, you, you, you mess up once and you're guilty of breaking the entire law. And of course, that's something that nobody can tolerate or handle. Therefore, we are joyful in the grace we've been given from God. So, chapter 28. So it shall come to pass, if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and do all of his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. These are promises to Israel if they obey God. It says, and obviously being set, set high above all the nations. Um, I think we can cl clearly see that this has not yet happened. So some of these blessings are going to be blessings that Israel will experience in the millennial reign. But we have a long ways to go before then, starting here at verse 2. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you, if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. <clears throat> Just picture blessings chasing you down. Blessed you shall be in the city and be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the fruit of the ground, the fruit of your cattle, 
increase of your cattle and your flocks of the sheep. Blessed should be your basket and your store. The basket is just like your pantry and um, the store. Um, this also talks about um, your kneading bowl, like um, making bread. Blessed shalt thou be when you come in and blessed shalt thou be when you go out. So this is inconceivable a lot of times. And of course, in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings, but we don't often live in that or accept it, realizing that when I leave the house, I'm blessed. And when I'm in the house, I'm blessed. Which is a beautiful thing because there are people that dread going back into their house. Very sad situation. Blessed be your basket and your store, verse 7. The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come against you one way and flee before you seven ways. It's a beautiful promise. It's interesting because a person might not, might not even realize it's happening. Imagine a gang decides to come and mug you and they're getting ready to jump you and God protects you and they all run off in different directions. You don't even know why. Of course, this is talking about battles and wars, uh, enemies. Uh, just a reminder that um, from the very beginning, I promised to bless those that bless Israel and curse those that curse the Israel. So um, as God disciplines Israel throughout much of the rest of the Old Testament, God uses, um, as we'll be seeing soon here, Babylon, of course. However, God still punishes those that mess with Israel. So verse 8, the Lord shall command the blessing upon you in the storehouses and all that you settle thy hand unto. In other words, everything you undertake, every project you start, be blessed. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Once again, a statement of future fact, God is going to give you this land. He's already given it and you will inherit it. <clears throat> Now, verse 9, the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto you. This is probably the greatest blessing of all, to be established by God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has learned us is God. God establishes us. Probably the worst thing we can try to do is establish ourselves try to set ourselves up, try to plan our own lives without God, try to succeed without God. God's one that establishes us. And of course, verse 22, 2 Corinthians 1, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our heart. The earnest is like the collateral, the down payment. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is our down payment. It is the confirmation that when we die, we'll be in heaven. When we die, uh, we are guaranteed to be made, um, made perfect, guaranteed to be clean, guaranteed to be prepared as a bride. <clears throat> so verse 9, again, the Lord will establish you a holy people unto himself. And he has sworn unto you, if you shall keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. The important thing about this covenant here, this is part of the Mosaic covenant. This starts at Mount Sinai, of course. The nations agreed to it, and the nation agreed to it as a nation. It's, it's binding upon their posterity, upon their children. And here, Moses is explaining this to the second generation. This is a covenant that has already been made. They are in the process of agreeing to it again agreeing to it for their generation. <clears throat> and Moses is like a father who is warning their child not to make a bad decision, yet kind of knows they're going to make a bad decision anyway, which is why he is so impassioned here. Moses is almost in a state of desperation. He is trying to present them, please, please, please follow God. If you don't, this is what's going to happen. And we'll see the horrendous consequences of not following God as we finish this chapter. But he's just saying, remember these commandments and walk in them. Walk in God's ways. 
Verse 10, if you do this, all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Um, it's a good thing for your enemies to be afraid of you. When they finally, finally did go into the promised land, remember when they met Rahab, she talked about, everybody knows um, what happened to the Egyptians. People in the in the promised land, the Canaanites, they're, they were nervous. They heard what happened to the three nations before they got to the promised land. And the fear of the Lord, this goes all the way through um, um, even in Nineveh. They, they were nervous. They didn't want to mess with the Hebrew God. They should be afraid of you. Verse 11, and the Lord shall make you plenteous in goods, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of the ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give thee. If you remember back in Deuteronomy 9, God reminded them that when they enter the land and when they succeed and when they, they reclaim the land and all the evils purged out of the land, God reminded them that, that their success had nothing to do with their goodness. Remember, that, I think there were four reasons that God gave for their success. One, their success was a punishment on the Canaanites. Two, it was a promise from God. Three, it was um, <clears throat> thinking it was a fact that wickedness had to be removed from the land. And the fourth one was just grace. And it says, even though you're stiff necked, I'm going to bless you anyway. So, <clears throat> The blessing of the promised land is the promise. The promise comes from the unconditional covenant of Abraham. I'm going to give you this land and you're my people. That was a promise that did not depend on their behavior. Unconditional promise. Yes, it was forestalled 40 years, but it still happened. So here at the end of verse 11, the Lord swore unto your fathers to give you. Verse 12, the Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of your hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and shalt not borrow. That's the definition of a prosperous nation and a prosperous person. Uh, the first part there with the rain, remember they were reminded that back in Egypt, they had to water all the land that they worked by foot, which meant either carrying buckets of water and filling the irrigation, or they had foot-powered pumps that would try to bring the water from the Nile up into the lands, because Egypt was a desert. And they were told in the promised land, you're gonna get rain that, from the skies and water flowing down from the mountains. You are not gonna have to be irrigating your land. Uh, this whole idea of lending unto many nations uh, is something that most of our governments forget, but, you know, when you are a borrower, the borrower is always slave to the lender. And um, when we're borrowing from other countries, borrowing from our children, it, it really can't end well. If you're in a position to always be able to lend money, let's face it, that means you're prosperous, and that's a beautiful thing. In verse 13, the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and not beneath. That phrase, head not the tail, is something that comes up throughout much of scripture. And it's, it's, it's a strange thought in the sense that we are always following the Lord. We're always submitting to him. But in our submission, we acquire the authority that God has. Jesus Christ has full authority. We're in Christ. We have full authority. Our authority is, you know, as God leads, is, is phenomenal. Authority over sin, authority over situations, authority in prayer. And being the head and not the tail means that I don't react to circumstances and situations. Um, in many ways, this is what being a human being in the image of God is all about. A human being in the image of God is not dependent on their environment. A human being in the image of God is not 
a slave to react to what happens. Bad things happen. If you're not in Christ, you're going to react like a normal, average, fallen human being. And in many ways, that's very animalistic. You know, someone slaps you, you slap them back without thinking. A bad thing happens and you get mad. It's rainy and you're in a bad mood. Um, these things are things that being made in the image of God and having God's spirit are things that should not affect us. We're supposed to be above that. And we have the power and privilege of doing that. Being the head, not the tail, means that with God's leading, I'm in charge. I'm above the issues of the day. I'm above the squabbles and the, the um, emotions, the petty fighting, the bickering. I'm above the, the bureaucracies of, of everyday life. An interesting thought is um, people in psychiatric care often say that they, they discover uh, growth, they discover success, that the phrase is this, when I stop listening to myself, I start talking to myself. In other words, I decide my feelings, I decide my reactions, putting yourself in charge of your emotions, even, you know, and I mean, I have kids at school and you know, Baptin made me mad. No, you decided to become mad and you let that person control you. So being the head, not the tail, is who we're called to be in Christ. You know, it doesn't mean we're abusive or, or totalitarian. It just means that we, we are above and not below, like it says right here. It says you will be above only and not beneath. We're not subject to our environment. Of course, in this case, it says, if you hearken unto the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. These blessings are conditional. Since Christ fulfilled the law, these blessings are things that are part of being in Christ. And, uh, of course, our blessings are spiritual, but we can apply any one of these to our lives and allow God to apply them as he sees fit. Verse 14, and you shall not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. An important thought here is they were warned not to take part in Canaanite celebrations or rituals when it came to their crops. One could be tempted, if it hasn't rained for a couple of days, one could be tempted to go and try out one of the Canaanite remedies, you know, go to some rain God or some fertility God. And God's saying, no, you, you come to me when you need the rain. You don't go to other gods. So that's the good news. 14 verses of good news. Verse 15. But it shall come to pass. This is it will come to pass. And then it adds if. If you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments. And his statutes, which I command you this day, that all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So as I said, this entire chapter is the future history of Israel. This is the history of what happens when we are in a conditional contract with God. God says, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If not, you'll be cursed. And our fallen human nature takes laws and just turns them into poison. Um, you know, all you have to do is be told no cookies before dinner. And all of a sudden, the thing we weren't even thinking of now becomes a desire to climb up and steal some cookies. Laws always trigger in our fallen nature rebellion. So this is a necessary part of God's revelation to let us look and see what happens to a nation that is under the law. And of course, we have yet to see the fulfillment of all these prophecies. Um, this chapter, I think we can see is still in partial fulfillment even today. And so let's dive in. Verse 16, it starts out with just kind of copying the blessings. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, 
and cursed shall be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your stir. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land, the increase of your cows, the flocks of your sheep. Cursed you shall be when you come in, and cursed you shall be when you go out. The Lord shall send upon you cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest your hand unto to do, until you be destroyed, and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. People that like to use the verses in Deuteronomy 28 to um, defend a, like a prosperity gospel, ignore the rest of the chapter. Yes, we do believe in a God that blesses. Yes, we do need, believe in a God that leads. But if I start doing certain things and thinking God owes me because of some legalistic basis, I better be ready for, um, you know, if I make a mistake, you know, you know, God can just easily shut down my business too if I start trying to play games like that. We understand principles and principles guide us, but... Just remember, in the law, the Christians come with the blessings. We have Christian groups that say, we like to follow the law as well, whether it's dietary or um, <clears throat> liturgical or um, administratively. And it's always amusing. Oh, so you're going to pick and choose which parts of the law to fulfill. That's why Paul said, if you're going to fulfill the law, you better do it all. In, in Galatians, he talks about that. So vexations and rebuke verse 20 and all that you set your hand to do because you just forsake forsook me verse 21 the lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you until he have consumed you from the, off the land where you can now go to possess it the lord shall smite you with a consumption with a fever to waste away with a fever with inflammation extreme burning with the sword with blasting which means blight and mildew and they shall perish until you shall perish like a pursue until you shall perish so we can look at the history of israel and see that you know they they went downhill pretty quickly and eventually babylon was raised up to accomplish these very things okay babylon was raised up to to um to punish um overtake and drive them from the land but some of these were the warnings that happened before that. Uh, verse 23, and the heaven that is over the head shall be brass. What this means is like the heaven is, gives no rain. We saw this also in Amos. The phrase be brass means it's like, like a sheet metal. There's no rain coming from it all. And the earth that is under you shall be like iron. In other words, you can't till it. It's so hard and so dry. There were times in Israel's history, long before Babylon, where Remember, um, prophets would stop the rain, and there would be times of, of punishment. Again, lots of mercy here because God's ultimate punish is to have foreign invaders take you away, and we haven't gotten there yet. <clears throat> but different things to try to get Israel's attention and bring them back. At every stage, Israel could always repent and be renewed, and they did it many, many times. It was just ultimately like in Jeremiah and Amos, where they were told, okay, it, there's no more time for repentance. Now the judgment is coming. And even then, in, in compassion and mercy, God gave them plans of how to survive. Verse 24, the Lord shall make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until you be destroyed. The Lord shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you should be removed from all the kingdoms of the earth. Once again, at the time of the Babylon invasion, the people of Israel said, God, you made a deal with Abraham. You can't destroy us because we're always going to be here. And God says, no. The promise is that you will always be there eternally, but um, I got to keep both my promises. And God wipes them out and then restores them. Restoration is a big principle that we see more later on but to be, be removed verse 26 your carcasses shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and of the beasts of the earth 
and no man shall fray or frighten them away. In other words, when animals come to eat your dead bodies, there's going to be no one around to try to shoo them off. The Lord will smite thee with the botch, with the boils of Egypt, with the hemorrhoids, and with scabs and itches where you cannot be healed. The Lord will smite you with madness and blindness and astonishment at heart. And ast astonishment here means bewilderment, confusion. You shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness and shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and spoiled or um, rotten evermore, and no one shall save you. <clears throat> we see here it says about blindness. We'll see a little bit later. Remember King Zep um, Zephaniah was killed by the Babylonians, and he was forced to watch his sons be killed before they took out his eyes to assure that his son's death was the last thing he ever saw. Verse 30, you shall betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Again, just isolated images of what's happening. This is like um, forcefully. You shall build a house, and you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, and will not gather the grapes thereof. Your ox shall be slain from before your eyes. You shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be violently taken away from before your face, and shall not be restored to thee. Your sheep will be given to the enemies. You should have none to rescue them. So this is this is getting worse and worse. And of course, again, you look at the history of Israel and realize that um, all these warning signs happened before Babylon came, Nebuchadnezzar came, and took them away in, in stages here. Verse 32, your sons and daughters shall be given unto another people. And your eyes shall look and fail with longing with them all the day long, and there shall be no might in your hand. So Nebuchadnezzar, the first invasion of Nebuchadnezzar was just a simple surrounding, conquering the capital, declaring that Israel would now belong to Babylon. And he took away the intelligentsia, the nobility, and took them back to Babylon. He set up a little puppet king. And that was stage one. He didn't really destroy Jerusalem. Later on, when they when they betrayed him, he came back and conquered a lot more of the land and took, took um, captives in you know, huge numbers, which is where Ezekiel is part of that. And then when the last king refused and betrayed him, he came back and had to destroy Jerusalem completely, destroy the temple. And so it was incremental. So the sons and daughters are taken away and you have no, no help, no might in your hand. You, you just can't help it. Verse 33, the fruit of your land and all your labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up and you shall be only oppressed and crushed always. So again, Moses is saying this and he's very, very impassioned about this. Please, please don't let this happen. But he's also hearing this from God. And again, you and I know the rest of the story. We know that eventually Babylon came and did this. Be crushed so that you will be mad for the sight of your eyes, which you'll see. The things that you see are going to drive you mad. The Lord shall strike you on the knees and in your legs with sore boils that cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Verse 36, and the Lord shall bring you and your king, which you set over you, unto a nation which thou, neither thou nor thy fathers have known. So verse 36 here is saying that in the future, the king that you pick is going to be captured. Now, of course, they have no king. They have no plans for a king. God is their king. But if you remember earlier on in Deuteronomy, Moses did give instructions, should they wish someday to have a king. He says, if you decide you want a king, here's the instructions that a person is supposed to be. And one of the requirements of this king is he was supposed to sit down and with his hand, his own hand, write out a copy of the law. And it would be his copy that he had to refer to, keep it next to his throne. That's where the term Deuteronomy comes from, was a, a second law or copy of the law. And so here, 
letting us see the prophetic nature of this chapter, we see God is saying, yes, someday, if you, be, if you um, don't keep the law and you don't respond to the warnings and the judgments, um, even your king is going to be taken away to a land that you know not of. Of course, no one knew what Babylon was at the time Moses sang this. You shall serve other gods, wood and stone. And you shall become an astonishment. Of course, what this means is um, a wonder. Like people are open their mouths in, this, in, in horror. A proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord shall lead thee. So we now see they're being led out of their, led out of their land. They're going to be removed from their land. This byword here is, we just hear, you don't hear the phrase too much now, but the wandering Jew. The idea that the Jewish person is a person without their own land. And of course, until 1948, that was true. Um, this is a saying that, <clears throat> remember, God's number one goal is that his name be acknowledged and that the world acknowledge him. And if Israel refuses to allow God to be seen as great because of his blessings, he will, he will still insist on, you, you will see him to be great because he keeps his word and great because of his punishments. Either way, we can look back in history and see, yes, God's in charge. God kept his word and God is faithful, you know, in whatever he says. Verse 38, you shall carry much seed out into the field and shall gather little. The locusts will consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them, but you shall not drink of the wine nor gather in the grapes, for worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all the coast, but you shall not anoint thyself with the oil. Olive trees shall throw away its fruit. So you can plant all you want, but nothing's going to work out for you. Of course, these are all conditional. The beginning of this chapter, the big, big word, if. This is olive trees. You shall beget sons and daughters, but you shall not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All your trees and the fruit of your land shall locusts consume. The strange of that is within you shall get above thee very high, and you shall come down very low. In other words, foreigners are going to be kicking over your lands. Um, Non-Jews are going to be um, <clears throat> collecting things that you thought belonged to you. He shall lend to you and shall not, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head and you shall be the tail. So there's a lot, you know, I mean, this is rough, but applications. If I'm living in the spirit, I'm the head of my circumstances. If I decide on a given day to just live in the flesh, I am going to be the tail of my circumstances. I am going to... Be like the rest of the world when it comes to reacting to situations, being knocked around by every strange wind, every um, decision. The people around me are going to control my emotions. So as something for us just, you know, as, as spirit-filled Christians to be on the lookout for, am I the, am I the head in this situation or have I allowed myself to become the tail? Verse 45, moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and shall pursue thee and overtake thee until you are destroyed. Because you did not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. It shall be a sign and a wonder upon your seed forever. Because you serve not the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Um, there's a big break right here. There's a break in this, in this set because this is pretty much the end of the curse in this sense, the end of the first set of curses. You can see this is what happened when Babylon came in. They took captives. They took over the lands. And progressively, they, after three sieges, eventually the, city, the country was destroyed and pretty much laid waste. So, verse 48, therefore shalt thou serve the enemies which the Lord sends against thee. This is actually a brand new section. 
this is saying that the Lord's going to send enemies against you. And, you, you, and you, the first thought is, well, weren't the last several verses about enemies being sent against me? Israel had this happen twice. Okay? They were taken out of their land by force, by, by foreign powers. And here it says it's going to happen again. In between the lines, let's have this thought that there's no way the Israelites can be taken out of their lands again unless they went back in between the first time and the second time. And as we see the description of this set of curses, this is basically, as you'll see as we go along, this is Israel being removed from their land a second time. You shall serve the enemies the Lord sends against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in want of all things. He shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck until he's destroyed you. So second time around, and you see what I mean. Yoke of iron. This is not Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Iron in Daniel stands for the iron beast, which we see as Rome. And with the thought of Rome in your head, you'll see that the rest of these verses apply to Rome. The Lord shall bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose tongue you shall not understand. No, this is, this is from, from Italy, from, from the Alchemist speaking Latin, right? The eagle, a nation of fierce covenants, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. As horrible as Nebuchadnezzar was, he did show a favor to the young. Remember, he took the young people, he taught them, he tried to, um, you know, enculturate them. Not necessarily the best thing to do, but he, you know, he just didn't destroy indiscriminately like Rome did. Rome is the, the iron beast that just stomps and destroys indiscriminately. He says, this new king will not show favor to the young. He shall eat the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land, until you be destroyed, which also shall not leave you corn, wine, oil, or the increase of your flocks, or flocks of your sheep, the increase of your cows, or flocks of sheep, until they have destroyed you. This is um, just completely destructive. Nebuchadnezzar didn't really spend too much time trying to destroy the land. Um, when Rome came in, they, they, they destroyed the land. Um, I think it's in 132 AD, there was one final revolt, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And after that, Rome came in and just plowed the land with salt. They said, We're, you're not going to have crops here. That's why when you see old Bible movies filmed on location in the Holy Land, it's always desert. And you think, I thought it was land of milk and honey. Well, it was until Rome got to it. So, verse 52, again, Rome. He shall besiege you in all your gates until the high and fenced walls come down, wherein you trusted. Throughout all the land, he shall besiege you in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God has given you. Again, the siege of Jerusalem lasted three years. The Roman um, general who was in charge, uh, what was his name? Uh, yeah, Vespasian. He came to Jerusalem and he put the siege up there and he decided to wait out because he realized that <clears throat> what happened is the rabbis and the religious people really believed that God would show up at any moment and save them because they read Zechariah 9, Zechariah 12, and they saw that Rome was the fourth beast. And they expected God to come rescue them. Uh, the problem was, is they hadn't read the rest of Zechariah talking about how, how to identify their Messiah. They hadn't read Isaiah, how to identify their Messiah. But they were expecting him. What happened, though, is you had different schools of thought and different factions. And there was a big fight among the rabbis in Jerusalem. They were, because of Zechariah 12, they are expecting a big war. When the Messiah comes along, they're going to join in the fight and start fighting. And so each different school of rabbis was constantly fighting with another school of rabbis, trying to be the best. As a result, 
they were fighting each other during the siege. They were sword fighting, killing, trying to be the last group standing so that when the Messiah showed up, they could um, show that they were the best ones available to serve. And Vespucian found out about this, and so he just put a siege to the land. He said if he had attacked, he would have united all of them against him. Instead, he let them kill themselves. Um, they were fighting each other. <clears throat> so, verse 53, and you will eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and of your daughters, which the Lord the God has given you, in the siege, in the straightness, wherein my enemies shall distress you. There were some horrible sieges in, in the books in the book of first second kings, but the one for Rome, you know, over six hundred thousand people just died during the siege, one point six million um, perished ultimately. And during that siege, yes, uh, women were eating the afterbirth. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. And um, uh, this is again, this is Rome. Your enemies shall distress you. 54. So much so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate. So the sweetest person you know, the person that wouldn't hurt a fly, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother. Toward the wife of his bosom. So in other words, it's going to be so stressful that he'll think of killing his brother just for a meal. Or killing his wife because he's hungry. And toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave. In other words, um, it doesn't matter how kind and sweet he is, it's going to be, um, um, he'll turn, okay? 35, so he will not give to any of them the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he has nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness. In his straightness, <clears throat> wherewith your enemies shall distress you in all your gates. The tender and delicate women among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. In other words, this is a very dainty woman, a person who would never do anything to even get her feet dirty. Her eyes going to be evil as well, towards the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter. And toward her young one that comes out from between her feet, and towards her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat of them for one of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, or with the enemy shall distress you in this gate. Again, this this is prophecy of Rome. These are the situations of Rome. Um, it's, it's much more, and you will see. We'll see why as we continue on here. Verse 58, if you will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord your God. When the people left Egypt and they heard God's voice given, given the Ten Commandments, they were terrified. They were afraid and they said, we don't want to hear that voice again. Moses said, no, no, put God's fear in front of you, not behind you. God's fear, yes, he's fearful and he's awesome, but he's on your side. He's got your back. And they couldn't handle that. We've been looking through Deuteronomy, and Moses has been trying to use God's track record to convince this second generation that God loves them. He loves them so much. He wants to bless them. All he asks is that. You obey him, and it should be simple. It should be simple enough. You obey him, God is going to then be free to give you these blessings. But if you refuse to, um, these curses. And yes, we live in grace as Christians, and the law does not apply to us in this sense. But we still, we can choose to live in the spirit, if we don't live in the spirit, then all of the fears and worries and guilt and other things can come back to haunt us. We step outside of our city of refuge, then um, Satan, we're kind of fair game for him. We're fair game for what he would uh, want to do to us. Remember, 
Yeah, he's still the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And our city of refuge, our safety is, of course, the blood of Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 59, then the Lord will make thy plagues, it says wonderful in the King James, this just means unbelievable. And the plagues of your seed, even great plagues and of long continuance, continuing on and on, and sore sicknesses of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon me all the diseases of Egypt. Just imagine Moses is just very impassioned. What can I say to really, really get their attention? And he drops this. He says, well, maybe it'll stick in their head. The last thing they want to do is go back to Egypt and other diseases that were there. They were promised that they were going to have health from obeying the law. You have your dietary health and your um, medical health and your quarantines, all the different things that, you know, science has shown is definitely healthy. And he's saying that if you don't do these things, you're going to go back to those diseases, the ones that you were afraid of, and they stick to you. 61, also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. So, when we went back to verse 35, it says, till you're destroyed. In other words, the nation is destroyed. They're allowed to go back. God's grace. Um, Jeremiah gave them 70 years. Daniel prayed. After 70 years, they were allowed to go back. The fact that a very small fraction went back, God considered that rebellion. And so the punishment continued. They stayed there. And of course, Ultimately, when Christ came and paid, fulfilled the law, the law was not necessary anymore. Remember when um, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the, the rabbis were very upset by this because he said, if he keeps doing this, people will stop coming to the temple and Rome will destroy us. This seems like a strange um, line of reasoning until you realize that they believed the temple was a good luck charm that kept Rome at bay. And they said, if this guy keeps healing people and people start following him, they'll stop going to the temple. They stop going to the temple, we'll stop making money, and the temple's going to fall. And that temple, which holds Rome at bay, will cease to exist, and Rome will destroy us. What's interesting, and it's, it was kind of prescient in a way, because the fact is that once Christ fulfilled the law, paid for sin on the cross, and rose again, the temple became unnecessary and the temple was destroyed so that people would not continue offering blood sacrifices which in hebrews is an offense to god now let's face it if jesus christ paid for your sins by shedding his blood on the cross it's kind of rude to go back and say i'm going to kill another sheep or another bull just in case what christ did didn't didn't accomplish it that's why the writer of Hebrews warns people, don't go back to that system. So, verse 46, uh, I'm sorry, verse 63. It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord, Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to nothing. Again, this is the same theme. God says, I will be regarded as great by the heathen. The world will know that I am God, one way or the other. They will either watch Israel be blessed and they'll say, wow, I guess God is real. Or they'll watch Israel be destroyed exactly as God said would happen, and they will say, wow, God is real. Either way, God gets the glory and God gets the credit. So this is a little reminder here, verse 63. It says, either way, it says, God is going to rejoice over you. God is going to rejoice because God is fulfilling his word. Verse 64, and the Lord shall scatter you among all people. There you go. When they were captured by Babylon, they weren't scattered among all the different nations. Babylon did sell some as slaves, and they went to Tyre and a couple other places, but you know, the bulk of the captives went straight to Babylon. But in this, this verse here is about the diaspora. This is about 
Jews being sent over the entire world. I will scatter you among all people from the one end of the earth even to the another. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest, for the Lord shall give you there a trembling heart, a failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. Throughout the diaspora, the entire history of the Jewish people up until today, um, when they find themselves in a foreign land, it's always nerve wracking. They never know if they're gonna be accepted. They never know um, how they're gonna work out. Um, the first thing Jews do in a foreign land is to try to set up business, try to set up some sort of economy, set up security, and they follow the law and God blesses it. And they can become very wealthy and they can set up security but the security is always short lived because eventually a nation will try to run them out. I'm thinking about the history of Judaism or Jewry in, um, in Europe, you know, throughout a wandering Jew, they would set up some kind of business, try to find social security, try to make people like them. And then the currency would change or the economy would collapse or a war would happen. And always they're kicked out. Um, one program to one program to the next, always being forced out, never knowing whether what they're doing right now is going to be worth anything the next day. Um, some um, movie that people should always watch is Fiddler on the Roof. This, you know, you're doing your work, living in a community, but you never know when the powers that be suddenly say, "Ah, oh, no Jews today. Time for the Jews to leave." 1492 is when Spain kicked all the Jews out of their country. Uh, this always leads up to a discussion about Hitler, of course, but and Hitler was just the last of a long string of um, leaders trying to destroy and hurt the Jew. Now, these punishments on the Jew are not because God hates the Jews. They are consequences of God keeping his word. God loves the Jewish people. He has a future for them, and there is serious punishment on anybody that does hurt the Jews. You can look throughout all of European history. The nations that hurt the Jews didn't last too long. Um, Britain protected them for a while and then they sold them out. You can see all the different sorts of North African countries that in history blessed the Jews for a while and then um, dissed them or dismissed them and their lands turned to desert. The British Empire, when there was a Jewish friendly place, covered the world. Now they can barely hang on to their own little island. You can go through a history. America has a history of respecting Judaism. George Washington wrote letters to synagogues all throughout the country, letting them know that the people of the book would always be protected here in America. <clears throat> so those are exceptions though. Verse 66, and your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you will say, would God that it were evening. In the evening you say, would God it were morning. This is an incredible poetic picture. At night you're going, I'm so terrified. Who's going to break in? Who's going to kill me? Who's going to kill my family? I wish it were morning so I could see. And then when morning comes along during the daylight hours, you go, oh my gosh, I wish it were night so I could hide. This is constant terror. It says, would God were morning for the fear of your heart wherewith you shall fear and for the sight of your eyes, which you shall see. Living by sight, living by fear. This is a curse of living outside of God's provision. And verse 68, 68 and the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. Now, why Egypt here? It just said they're going to all the nations. This is more specific because um, when the Romans, you know, they killed lots and lots of Jews, obviously, but um, the ones they captured, they sold into slavery. And they sent them straight to Egypt, which was a center for slavery. You know, bring into Egypt with ships, by the way, wherever I spake unto you, you shall see it no more again. 
you won't see your land again, and there you will be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So I know it's the last verse here, but the horror is here of being told that someday, because you disobeyed, you're going to be sold as a slave. But unfortunately, no one's going to buy you. And it's exactly what happened. He said, um, when the Romans, they just took shiploads, a shiploads, shiploads of slave to Egypt, and it was a glut on the market. There was just too many slaves, not enough buyers, and eventually um, the value was zero. Just being, being sold as a slave, and no one buys you because that's how worthless you are. Uh, it's a rough place to end here. I didn't want to rush through it, though. Um, chapter 29 is the contract version of this. And, of course, chapter 30 is the thing that we're all waiting for, the promise of restoration. What I'm going to do instead, I want to turn to Isaiah 11 to finish this up. Isaiah chapter 11, verse... 11 it says and it shall come to pass in that day that the lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people so we know from history that jesus that um god recovered he brought back the remnant from babylon back to israel and he set them up again they were under the stewardship of um, Persia, as was also prophesied, and of course they were not their own nation; they were a protectorate of Persia. They couldn't have their own king. We know that Israel will never have its own king until the Messiah comes and reigns as king and high priest. But here, right here, a second time, we know that in history the Jews were dispossessed of their land by Rome. And they're sent all over the world. And we know here that a second time, and just for the record, the last time, it'll never, ever happen again, never to be dispossessed again. He will recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. When you see the phrase islands of the sea, this is a euphemism for all the unknown lands in the world. We see this in the servant songs in Isaiah. Uh, the far mountains, islands of the sea. This is a promise that God will regather his people a second time. And of course, it's also the last time. Never, ever again to be dispossessed. We, we are in the middle of that regathering right now. We see the bones being brought together in 1948. We see people returning. We see the nation established. Now remember, they were told when they went into the promised land to, to um, take the entire land, the entire land that was promised to Abraham, and they never have, not to date. They never have taken over the ge geographical portion of land that belongs to them. Remember, they were told to build additional groups of cities of refuge. Once they expanded their land, they never expanded to include all the land that they were told to. We've talked about that before. When they are fully brought back in, they're going to go through the tribulation period. The tribulation period is going to have some of the elements that we see here, but not to be dispossessed. Yes, the Antichrist is going to wage war on them. He's going to try to kill them all to prevent God from keeping his promise to them. He's going to capture a third and then the same, same narrative, basically. But we know that the remnant there will flee, will call out to God, will acknowledge Christ as their Messiah, will say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Christ will answer their prayer and rescue them. And then Zechariah 12 kicks in. Yes, then they will wage war on all the people that are dispossessing them christ will be doing the fighting just going down the valley all the way to rescue those from petra um as the sword from his mouth just wiping out anybody that it covers whatever that looks like we don't know we just know that 
descriptions in Ezekiel say that they'll kill them and the skin will burn off their bodies before the bones hit the ground. So whatever weapon Christ is using, he is winning that war as he reclaims his people. And ultimately, all these blessings we read will be fully, fully, fully realized. Israel will be the chief among all nations. Israel will be the number one representative of God and his grace. <clears throat> so Isaiah 11, 11, that's just a good verse to pull out when someone's kind of a skeptic about this. It's right there in black and white. Second time, and that's it. That's the last time. God is faithful, and that is where our confidence and rejoicing comes from. Yes, ugly stuff happens throughout the history of the world. That's because people are fallen and wicked people do wicked things. But God's plan of rescue and God's plan of demonstrating his sovereignty includes all of this. Our job is to rejoice that our name is written in the book of life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this chapter. Thank you for this heavy, heavy wisdom that gives us the knowledge that you are in control, that you see the end from the beginning, and you do have a plan. So God, we just pray right now, if anyone has not accepted you as your Savior, accepted Jesus Christ and his blood, so that they can escape the curses and escape the wrath, we pray they would do that now. We just thank you for these, these thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Phew. Well, I have learned more about being Jewish through you than I learned from anybody in temple. Hmm. But I'm a wee bit confused over why you say that Rome was the first time they returned to Israel. No, Babylon was the first time. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Rome was the second, second time, time they were dispossessed, yeah. kicked out. Yeah. I must maybe I misspoke one one of my phrases there. Okay. Yeah. Babylon kicked them out. Yep. Yep. And then Rome came and started the ball rolling to make it a global diaspora. It's just amazing. Why don't the Jews teach their own history like this? Um. It's just an indictment. Um, I've seen and heard about Holocaust documentaries that the, you know, the, the, the copy and the words came from Deuteronomy. Yeah. It's just rough. You know, put it this way. It's kind of mean if I were to look to a Jewish person and say, look, you guys screwed up. Here's what happened to you. Read book Deuteronomy 28. You know, we don't want to go down that path when it comes mm -hmm. to you know, reaching out to somebody. But um, it's, it's so clear that obedience is so simple and they make it so complicated. Well, it is simple, but by that same token, our fallen human nature makes obedience yeah. in some ways impossible. Right. That's yeah. the purpose for the cross and the purpose for grace. Yeah. Remember, you. Jesus was asked, show yeah. us the works of God so we can do them. And Jesus said, okay, here's the works. Believe on the one he sent. We are not capable of obedience. All we can do is receive the grace, and the grace slowly teaches us obedience. And the primary method it uses to teach us obedience is changes our heart. So we actually don't want to rebel. So we actually do want to do the right thing. And this is a it's a it's a lifelong process. But in the meantime, we accept the grace and accept the promise and provision. Remember, the church is grafted in to this law. And this law is it's conditional, right? Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound strange, but in a sense, our salvation is conditional because we've been grafted into this law. 
what makes our salvation unconditional is that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and we're in him. So since he totally fulfilled the law in every jot and tittle, every attitude, every application, every spiritual interpretation of the law, he totally fulfilled it. We then are beneficiaries of that promise yeah. of the law. Yeah. And of course, our promise is kingdom and heaven focused. You know, the Jewish law in its most spiritual way is still an earthly system. The biggest end game in Judaism is the millennial kingdom. Talking about prosperity on the earth, getting along with your neighbors. Um, it's, you know, it's not focused on heaven. You and I are focused on heaven. You and I are focused on reigning and living with Christ someday. And which, which gives, which puts a spiritual application to all of this. You know, I certainly believe in prosperity, but as a Christian, God can choose prosperity that may be different than the one I'm thinking. And my prosperity in my relationships, and God gives me prosperity in soul winning. I may want prosperity in money, and he gives me prosperity, you know, in my family. You know, God might choose to give some. He certainly has, and many, many people are blessed with, with financial prosperity, and I still would... I have no problem being being tested in that area. But. I like how you said the laws always make us attuned to our sinful nature. In your example of no cookies until after dinner or something. Um, I mean, it reminds me, I was probably like five or six over Christmas time. Grandma and grandpa were at, at the house for Christmas time. And I guess I was helping grandma bake or something and she went to the restroom or something and she said, well, don't touch. Mm. Well, of course, and I had to touch the burner. And I, she comes back out, I'm like, she goes, did you touch? Mm. And I didn't get reprimanded. Mm. I mean, that burn was enough and yet I knew she was disappointed in me. Sure. I never did it again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was that. Don't do it. I mean, do that for their children all the time. No, you don't do that. Well, then that puts it in their frame of mind that then it's up to them. Are they going to trust and obey us? Yeah. Or are they going to go ahead and go ahead and suffer the consequences? That's why the Bible tells us the law is perfect. We look at the law and go, this looks rough. This is bad. This, you know, but the law, it's, it's, it's objectives and its goals are absolutely perfect. They're beautiful. It, it has its, its a perfect place. The problem is, is that when the law touches our fallen human nature, we pervert it. We, we, you know, you know, where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. But the law causes sin to abound. You know, the when you're in, when you're ignorant, you have a few laws. All of a sudden, God comes along and says, "Here's the rest of all the laws," and if we were godly, we'd say, oh, thank God, now I know the rest of the rules. But no, we're fallen. And we'd, we'd, instead, we say, no, don't tell me what to do. And ultimately, that is why the law has to be written in our heart, because we're never going to respond to external law. Every step of the way in the nation of Israel, God tried to find new ways to get them to remind themselves, but they're, they're all external. You know, put, put blue tassels on your, put, put stuff on your hands, on your foreheads. Do all these things, the visual cues, things to remind you, you know, put posters up, put signs. At some point, it's not going to matter. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about um, how miracles have, have no effect on us either. Miracles are never going to cause us to change our mind. And Moses talks about that as he's setting up the, the more formal contract. <laughs> Hey, around first age or so, you had some First Corinthians um, references. First, uh, Second Corinthians one. Okay. Twenty-one, twenty-two. Where was that? It was around verses, verse eight or so. Second Corinthians one, verses twenty-one, twenty-two. Okay. Yeah, about establishing, about being established in Christ. So the and how the sealing of the Holy Spirit is the down payment, the confirmation that that we are 
eternally secure. So any, any other thoughts? Hi, Ada, good to see you. Well, I'm fascinated again with the fact that the laws are so well written out and yet they, and the fact that they're, it's not important to get hooked on them. It, it's, it just seems like a paradox to me that he makes it so detailed and then the key, that's not the key. That's confusing to me, if you don't mind my saying so. No, no, I, I agree. Um, one of the purposes there was to let people know that God is a God of detail. Yeah, yeah. You know, and of course, the law had to, I mean, the law is the law. And the fact that one person in human history actually did keep it is all the more remarkable, you know. And well, we he didn't go outside the city to pee, Jesus. He didn't keep the law. I would imagine. I'm sure he, what, however the system was set up there. Um, it's interesting. People have often asked, well, did he declare himself unclean every time he touched someone that was unclean? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I contend that every time every person he touched became clean. Because he, he so that never actually happened. They were healed, yeah. Were healed, so. But it is complex, isn't it? It is, yeah. That's where your faith comes in, I think, a little bit. Yes. Uh, I don't well, know. I, I I would probably say that yes. Um, if he had to go outside of the camp to do that, he I'm sure a large city had a system set up to accommodate that. He he would have would have done that. He would have done whatever the law was requiring at that time. Mm -hmm. And it has changed throughout the years, you're right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, different, I mean, you talk about the law being detailed and complex, but one of the big issues with the supposed oral law that the rabbis of Jesus' day or the rabbis of today do is that much of the law is actually not as detailed as they would like. Mm -hmm. The law for like, like Sukkot or the law for some of the feasts, mm -hmm. there's not as much detail and so, the oral law or the rabbinical systems will make up extra things to try to make it more spiritual, more holy. Yeah. And try to suggest that um, leaving things up to people's own interpretation is not allowed. So it, once again, it's a new, a new source for self-righteousness rather than allowing people to be flexible and creative and, um, you know, work with in whatever confines they have. I think it's so interesting here in Baltimore, the length of the seat, of the seat, seat the tassels on there. I mean, that, that's such a big deal here. And you can see how important that is. Very important. Uh -huh. Remember, Christ criticized the, the Pharisees for walking around with giant ones. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Going sure to Israel, did. you really see it. Yeah. Fascinating. It is. It's going to go be so wonderful when we get to the other side and get to see all what was really important and what wasn't. Won't it be, won't it be interesting? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the real life. Anymore. Say it again, Philip. None of this stuff in this life is important anymore. No. Really point, what's done for Christ is only thing that's going to last. All right. John, yes, I didn't have very good ears. I don't think <laughs> that scripture you gave Edith, I can't find it. Well, let's first see if I did wrong. What? I had thought you said first Corinthians, but I maybe misheard you also initially. Well, I've been all over second Corinthians and I couldn't find it, and maybe I heard the wrong verse. 
Ah, uh, who knows? Maybe I just wrote it down here. Yeah, first, Second Corinthians. I probably said first. You're right. Second Corinthians, chapter one, one. verse twenty-one and twenty-two. Now he which establisheth. Um, other verses say establish. I was focusing focusing on the word establish, but he he establishes us with you in Christ, and reminds us. God. God is the one that establishes us with you in Christ, who has also sealed us and given the earnest or the down payment of the Spirit in our hearts. Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses twenty-one and twenty-two. I didn't know the right verses. I was yeah, in my version, it is God who who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. That sounded like an amplified version, but it's not. Which one is that? I can never remember. <laughs> Friend here, I have so many. It's the um, New Living Translation. Okay. Excellent. Because that verse 23, as I quick looked at it, says you can call upon God as your witness, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool then. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's just Paul telling them that you can trust me with what I say. Right, right. I didn't, I didn't get to you as soon as I wanted to. Well, yeah, um, chapter 28 is a, a rough chapter to get past. It's probably not the most popular chapter in the temple reading cycle. <laughs> probably that, that's probably why they glossed over it all the time, right? Well, most commentaries kind of gloss over it. And you know what? It's straightforward. It doesn't need commentary. It's, it's no. you know, maybe to clarify a couple points. And I, when it starts morphing from the first to the second um, expulsion, you know, so people decide which, which verses that starts at. Um, I kind of just preferred starting where I did because it talks about a brand new king whose language you don't know and it talks about he has, doesn't care about the young and the old. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar did, and they did understand his language. Yeah, like we're studying, going through Daniel with our Sunday evening um, Bible study, and you know Nebuchadnezzar, you know as you, as you said initially, he brought in the young young guys and treated them well, mm -hmm. trained them in his way or tried to, um, but treated them well, you know, fed them the lovely rich foods of what they had you know, mm -hmm. as long as they were willing to eat it but yeah they went with the romans that's for sure one thought you might have is fun to toss out there as a group goes through daniel read it from the perspective of god loves nebuchadnezzar oh yeah we are still to get that we're mm -hmm. we just did chapter four oh, right last okay. week so yeah we're just doing a verse a week mm -hmm. a, a chapter a week doesn't mean he was a nice guy well, in the end, of course, he ended up becoming living like a donkey, but he came back, or changing yeah. the donkey, came back. So I mean, yeah. God, yeah, we rescued him and uh, restored him. Hey. Yeah, that that entire process of living like an animal, li li living off the grass, was something that is only going. God's only going to do that to someone that was a. That was a chastisement of one of his own. He had a full year to repent, yeah. I always thought that was great because Daniel said, please, please, that doesn't have to come to fruition. Just keep yourself humble. You'll be fine. And like, he lasted a year. <laughs> he managed to pull out and then finally one year just snapped. But there's a point. I mean, I, I do not contend that Nebuchadnezzar got, quote, saved at the... You know, at the the three Hebrew boys in the burning furnace, 
he acknowledged that the Hebrew God was maybe a little more important than he had once thought. But something happens there, and we don't have a record of it, but something happens where Nebuchadnezzar apparently accepts Daniel's God. And then that's why we get that letter from Nebuchadnezzar. He accepts the God. And then Daniel warns him about pride afterwards, not before. So I think it's, yeah, it's a powerful little story there. Yeah, we decided he was just bipolar. He was either all, oh, save him or kill him. You know, he was one way or the other. <laughs> I mean, that's that. Remember, the, of, of the four kingdoms, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is the most powerful in terms of power. Yeah. Because compared to the Persian kingdom, which came next, the Persian kingdom had enough of the rule of law that a Persian king could not countermand himself. Today, we call that a constitution. The idea that there's a, there is some law that restricts what a Persian king can do. No such law is restricted to Nebuchadnezzar. He can you know, change his one, mind on a whim. The one thing that we all thought was very interesting was, you know, after seven years, when has this ever happened to anybody in leadership? He got his full leadership and kingdom back. Right. And we kind of thought, well, maybe Daniel, being who Daniel was, mm -hmm. kind of in his position was able to maintain the reign and kingdom until God brought Nebuchadnezzar back. Yeah, maybe so that was stand really in for him. About, yeah. <laughs> to cover for him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I see you know, he was made head magi, so he would have a lot of clout at that point. Right. Well, not only him, but Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego yeah. would have been, you know, one, two, side. three, four, five in the Help top him. in the top reign. You know, right. th those four would have been, you know, starting with two, three, four, mm -hmm. five, and so that you know that had a lot of power in yep. in God being in control of the whole nation, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's why as we go into the next chapter, it's going to be you dumb kid. <laughs> Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so. Belshazzar. Belshazzar yeah. was such just a, a party boy jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. You have Nabonidus who was actually. Oh, yeah, grandson. Father. Yeah. Well, so now I, I thought this was his. Well, we don't have to get into that right now, but yeah. Yeah. So Nebuchadnezzar that we know of ne as Nebuchadnezzar actually is Nebuchadnezzar the second. Because right. his grandfather was Nebuchadnezzar, and then his father didn't rule very long. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember. I have to go back and look now because yeah, between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, there is an uncle that was put in place and got killed. Nabonidus, Nabonidus I think, or something like that. He's actually on, and he is actually actively involved in protecting the Babylon kingdom from Persian incursion. And his son is left home in the city of Babylon to um, supposedly watch out for it. But he is just, just a, a little party animal, could care less, knows that the city can survive under siege for a few years <laughs> and just is, you know, you know, drinking it and living it up. And of course, what's, what's interesting is as much as Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar, he despises Belshazzar. He just, you can see that Belshazzar makes Daniel sick. Belshazzar obviously has no use for Daniel. He's dismissed him. Daniel spent the last probably 20 some years being involved as the head magi, but having, no, having nothing to do with the kingdom because Belshazzar has just dismissed him. And only when he gets into real problems does he run to mommy and say, what should I do? And his mom said, well, don't forget, you have this magi that your grandfather set up. <laughs> you know, the Bible says father all the time because father is just, you know, yeah, ancestor. Anyway, I know that was kind of off topic, but you know, that that's, you know, as that ties into this, that was a that was the prediction here, 
Yeah. That was done, and, you know, and 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 as people look at these predictions, that a lot of the the people that look at them don't realize. I mean, we as Christians see them, mm -hmm. but it's surprising that even some of the Jewish people don't quite understand all of it. Yeah, it's, we just we can never overestimate how much work the Holy Spirit does in our hearts to give us some understanding of things it's just you know it looks obvious to us but it wouldn't without the holy spirit a lot of this well i'm amazed how much you see in the history that i've never seen so god has really given you a gift oh well i mean you tied things in that it would never occur to me to tie together it's fascinating well we have a History buff right here who'd like to see the whole picture too. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm so impressed. Yeah. Well, Judy, I think it's also because you're also a Christian as well that you're understanding this because just a little you know, bit. The, yeah. the normal <laughs> Jewish person, they're blinded. God has blinded their eyes yeah. and the ears. They're not fully understanding it. But your eyes have been opened by God already. Yes. So that's why you fully understand it makes it wow wondrous well and i i grew up on my grandmother's knee and my grandmother would was really into prophecy and so oh. um one of the things that that i remember from the 70s when i was you know first second third grade that was back when daniel writing about daniel had not yet been found in the archaeology world right and so in the early 70s, I would say like 72, 73, sometime in that time frame, they found Nebuchadnezzar's writings about Daniel. Oh. And so that was really proof because there was a lot of people that denied Daniel as being a real person. Right. And they also denied the book of Daniel, obviously can't be written by Daniel, Daniel didn't exist. But chapter 11 was a big bone of contention because there's no way anybody could possibly write that until after those events happened. Mm -hmm. You know, those events, <laughs> you know, two or three years in the future. And so it was this established fact that someone else beside Daniel, if even if Daniel existed, wrote that. And it wasn't until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found where they found copies of not only Daniel, but commentaries on Daniel and indications that Daniel was considered established scripture at right. least minimum of 250 years before Christ uh, before most of those events happened well I just think it kind of ties into you we have our past and current atheists that set out to disprove God and in the process end up proving God yeah you know yeah if they're honest they, they all come to those conclusions otherwise they I mean there's a few that say i know it doesn't make sense but i refuse to you know which is fine that's their choice. it doesn't always make sense to us either but <laughs> well yeah and, and to think about the providence of of really the whole process of how this happened with nebuchadnezzar and how nebuchadnezzar then set up daniel as the head of the magi and then the magi being there to save christ right as a baby and set Joseph up in Egypt so that they didn't have problems, you know, the, just Back to Egypt. <laughs> the whole process of this was set in motion with this passage we read today. Yeah. And here's what's going to happen. You guys need to be, you need to do what you're supposed to do, but we know you're not. So here's what's going to happen. That's pretty much message of the Bible. Here's what you do. And since you're not going to, here's your provision. Yep. <laughs> let's go ahead and close with the prayer Stuart you want to close with the prayer please yeah. Lord we want to thank you for this passage that shows us your provision and your guidance to what you will do no matter how many mistakes we make we praise you for the fact that you've brought us grace to get through each of these incidents in our lives and please give us the grace that we need for this following week until we meet again in thy name we pray Amen. Amen. Well, we'll see you all later. Blessings on you. Thank you for all your energy. Uh, real quick before we go, sorry. Let's pray for Janice. She's back in the hospital again. We'll take uh -oh. prayer for her. Lord, pray right now for our friend and sister Janice that you would continue to look over her. 
whatever his problems are, we pray that you just be repairing and fixing and healing right now, God. You are the creator. So just bless her, give her mind, comfort, and joy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Right. Amen. So we'll see you there. See you, Jody. See you, Janine. Bye. See you, Ada. God bless you. Bye, John boy. Lots of thank you. See you, Mom. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.